Chapter 5 The Life of Faith The Bible discloses for us the normal path of a Christian's walk in such passages as The righteous shall live by faith. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 1 verse 17 in the American Standard Version, Galatians 2 verse 20, and 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. By faith are we to live. While this principle may be quickly grasped in the mind, it is not so readily experienced in life. The life of faith is not only totally different from, but also diametrically opposite to, a life of feeling. He who lives by sensation can follow God's will or seek the things above purely at the time of excitement. Should his blissful feeling cease, every activity terminates. Not so with one who walks by faith. Faith is anchored in the one whom he believes, rather than in the one who exercises the believing, that is, himself. Faith looks not at what happens to him, but at him whom he believes. Though he may completely change, yet the one in whom he trusts never does, and so he can proceed without letting up. Faith establishes its relationship with God. It regards not its feeling because it is concerned with God. Faith follows the one believed, while feeling turns on how one feels. What faith thus beholds is God, whereas what feeling beholds is one's self. God does not change. He is the same God in either the cloudy day or the sunny day. Hence he who lives by faith is as unchanging as is God. He expresses the same kind of life through darkness or through light. But one who dwells by feeling must pursue an up-and-down existence, because his feeling is ever-changing. What God expects of his children is that they will not make enjoyment the purpose of their lives. God wants them to walk by believing him. As they run the spiritual race, they are to carry on whether they feel comfortable or whether they feel painful. They never alter their attitude towards God according to their sensations. However dry, tasteless, or dark it may be, they continue to advance, trusting God and advancing as long as they know this is God's will. Frequently, their feeling appears to rebel against this continuation. They grow exceedingly sorrowful, melancholic, despondent, as though their emotions were pleading with them to halt every spiritual activity. They nonetheless go on as usual entirely ignoring their adverse feeling, for they realize work must be done. This is the pathway of faith, one which pays no heed to one's emotion, but exclusively to the purpose of God. If something is believed to be God's mind, then no matter how uninterested one's feeling is, he must proceed to execute it. One who walks by sensation undertakes merely what he feels interested in. The one, however, who walks by faith obeys the complete will of God and cares not at all about his own interest or indifference. The life of feeling draws people away from abiding in God to finding satisfaction in joy, while the life of faith draws believers into being satisfied with God by faith. They having possessed God, their joyful feelings do not add to their joy, nor do their painful sensations render them woeful. A life of emotion induces the saint to exist for himself but a life of faith enables him to exist for God and cedes no ground to his self-life. When self is entertained and pleased, it is not a life of faith, but simply a life of feeling. Exquisite feeling does indeed please the self. If one walks according to sensation, it indicates he has not yet committed his natural life to the cross. He still reserves some place for self, wishing to make it happy, while simultaneously continuing to tread the spiritual path. The Christian experience, from start to finish, is a journey of faith. Through it we come into possession of a new life, and through it we walk by this new life. Faith is the life principle of a Christian. This is of course acknowledged by all saints, but strangely enough, many seem to overlook this in their experience. They forget that to live and to move by emotion or happy sensations is to do so by sight and not by faith. What is the life of faith? It is one lived contrary to a life of feeling, because it disregards feeling altogether. If Christians desire to live by this principle, 
they should not alter their demeanor or bitterly cry, as though bereft of their spiritual life, whenever they feel cold, dry, empty, or pained. We live by faith, and not by joy. The Deeper Work of the Cross When we forsake physical happiness and mundane pleasures, we are apt to conclude that the cross has finished its perfect work in us. We do not perceive that in God's work of annulling the old creation in us, there remains a deeper cross awaiting us. God wishes us to die to His joy and live to His will. Even if we feel joyous because of God and His nearness, in contrast to being joyous because of fleshly and earthly things, God's aim nevertheless is not for us to enjoy His joy, but to obey His will. The cross must continue to operate till His will alone is left. If we rejoice in the bliss God dispenses, but renounce the suffering He also dispenses, then we have yet to experience the deeper circumcision by the cross. Great is the contrast between the will of God and the joy of God. The first is ever present, for we can behold God's mind in His providential arrangement, but the second is not always present, since it is experienced only in certain circumstances and at certain times. When a Christian seeks the joy of God, he takes simply that part of his purpose which makes him happy. He does not desire the entire will of God. He chooses to obey God's aim when God makes him happy. But if he should cause him to suffer, he at once revolts against his will. But the person who receives his will as his life will obey regardless how God makes him feel. He can discern divine arrangement in both joy and suffering. During the initial stage of a Christian's experience, God allows him to delight in his joy. After he has advanced somewhat in his spiritual walk, God withdraws his joy, since this is profitable for the Christian. God appreciates the fact that should the believer seek and enjoy this kind of bliss too long, he shall not be able to live by every word which proceeds from his mouth. Instead, he shall live wholly by that word which makes him glad. Thus he abides in the comfort of God, but not in the God who gives comfort. For this reason, God must remove these pleasurable sensations so that his child may live exclusively by him. We know that the Lord at the commencement of our spiritual walk normally comforts us during those times we suffer on his behalf. He causes the believer to sense his presence, see his smiling face, feel his love, and experience his care in order to prevent him from fainting. When the believer apprehends the mind of the Lord and follows it, he usually gives him great pleasure. Although he has paid some price for following the Lord, yet the joy he obtains far surpasses what he has lost, and hence he delights to obey his will. But the Lord perceives a danger here. Upon having experienced comfort in suffering and happiness in heeding his mind, the child of God naturally looks for such comfort and joy the next time he suffers or obeys the Lord's will, or else expects to be helped immediately by his comfort and joy. Hence he suffers, or does the Lord's will, not purely for his sake, but for the sake of being rewarded with consolation and happiness as well. Without these crutches, he is powerless to continue. The will of the Lord becomes inferior to the joy which he bestows at the moment of obedience. God realizes his child is most eager to suffer if he is comforted, and is delighted to follow his will if he is accorded joy. But God now wishes to learn what motivates him, whether he suffers exclusively for the Lord's sake or for the sake of being consoled, whether he heeds God's mind because it should be heeded or because he derives some joy by so heeding. For this reason, after a Christian has made some progress spiritually, God commences to withdraw the consolation and delight which he gave him in the hour of suffering and obedience. Now the Christian must suffer without any ministration of comfort from God. He suffers externally while feeling bitter inwardly. He is to do the will of God without the least thing to stimulate his interest. Indeed, everything is dry and uninteresting. By this process, God will learn precisely why the believer suffers on his behalf and obeys his will. God is asking him, Are you disposed to endure without being compensated by my comfort? Are you ready to endure just for me? Are you amenable to perform labor which does not interest you a bit? Can you do it just because it is my purpose? Would you be able to undertake for me 
when you feel depressed, insipid, and parched? Can you do it simply because it is my work? Are you able to accept joyfully physical suffering without any compensation of refreshment? Can you accept it because it is given by me? This is a practical cross by which the Lord reveals to us whether we are living for Him by faith or living for ourselves by feeling. Frequently have we heard people say, I live for Christ. What does this really convey? Many saints assume that if they labor for the Lord or love the Lord, they are living for Christ. This is far from being exactly so. To live for the Lord means to live for His will, for His interest, and for His kingdom. As such, there is nothing for self, not the slightest provision for self-comfort, self-joy, or self-glory. To follow the mind of God because of comfort or joy is strictly forbidden. To recoil from, to cease, or delay in obedience because of feeling depressed, vapid, or despondent is positively impermissible. We ought to know that physical suffering alone may not be regarded as enduring for the Lord. For often our bodies will be bearing pain while our hearts are full of joy. If we actually suffer for Him, then not only do our bodies suffer, but our hearts feel pained as well. Though there is not the least joyfulness, yet we press on. Let us understand that to live for the Lord is to reserve nothing for self, but to deliver it willingly to death. He who is able to accept everything gladly from the Lord, including darkness, dryness, flatness, and completely disregard self, is he who lives for him. Should we walk by emotion, we can perform God's desire only as we have a happy feeling. But should we live by faith, we can obey the Lord in all regards. How often we do realize a certain matter is in fact God's will, yet we have not the least interest in it, and so we feel parched when we try to perform it. We have no registration that the Lord is pleased, nor do we experience His blessing or strengthening. Rather do we feel as if we are passing through the valley of the shadow of death, for the enemy is contesting our way. And alas, without mentioning the innumerable believers who today do not even follow God's will, there are those few following it who more or less only follow that part which interests them. They obey the mind of God solely when it suits their emotion and desire. Unless we advance by faith, we shall flee to Tarshish. See Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. In chapter 4, verse 2, we should inquire once again as to what the life of faith is. It is one lived by believing God under any circumstance. If he slay me, says Job, yet would I trust in him. Chapter 13, verse 15 in the Darby. That is faith. Because I once believed, loved, and trusted God, I shall believe, love, and trust him wherever he may put me, and however my heart and body may suffer. Nowadays, the people of God expect to feel peaceful even in the time of physical pain. Who is there who dares to renounce this consolation of heart for the sake of believing God? Who is there who can accept God's will joyfully and continuously commit himself to him even though he feels that God hates him and desires to slay him? That is the highest life. Of course, God would never treat us like that. Nevertheless, in the walk of the most advanced Christians, they seem to experience something of this apparent desertion by God. Would we be able to remain unmoved in our faith in God if we felt thus? Observe what John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress, proclaimed when men sought to hang him. If God does not intervene, I shall leap into eternity with blind faith come heaven, come hell. There was a hero of faith. In the hour of despair, can we too say, O God, though you desert me, yet will I believe you? Emotion begins to doubt when it senses blackness, whereas faith holds on to God even in the face of death. How few have arrived at such a level. How our flesh resists such a walk with God alone. The natural disinclination for cross-bearing has impeded many in their spiritual progress. They tend to reserve a little pleasure for their own enjoyment. To lose everything in the Lord, even self-pleasure, is too thorough going a death, too heavy a cross. They can be fully consecrated to the Lord. They can be suffering untold pain for Him. They can even pay a price for following the will of God. 
but they cannot forsake that obviously trifling feeling of self-pleasure. Many cherish this momentary comfort. Their spiritual life rests on this tiny twinge of feeling. Were they to exercise the courage to sacrifice themselves to God's fiery furnace, showing no pity or love for self, they would make great strides on their spiritual pathway. But too many of God's people remain subservient to their natural life, trusting what is seen and felt for safety and security. They have neither the courage nor the faith to exploit the unseen, the unfelt, the untrodden. They have already drawn a circle around themselves. Their joy or sorrow hinges upon a little gain here or a little loss there. They accept nothing loftier. Thus are they circumscribed by their own petty self. Were the Christian to recognize that God wishes him to live by faith, he would not murmur against God so frequently, nor would he conceive these thoughts of discontent. How swiftly would his natural life be cut away by the cross if he could accept the God-given parched feeling and could esteem everything given him by God as excellent. Were it not for his ignorance or unwillingness, such experiences would deal with his soul life most practically, enabling him to live truly in the Spirit. How sad that many succeed at nothing greater in their lives than the pursuit of a little feeling of joy. The faithful, however, are brought by God into genuine spiritual life. How godly is their walk! When they examine retrospectively what they have experienced, they readily acknowledge that the ordering of the Lord is perfect. For only because of those experiences did they renounce their soul life. Today's crying need is for believers to hand themselves over completely to God and ignore their feeling. This should not at all be misconstrued to signify, however, that henceforth we shall become joyless persons. Joy in the Holy Spirit is the greatest blessing in the kingdom of God. Romans 14 verse 17 The fruit of the Holy Spirit, moreover, is joy. Galatians 5 verse 22 If this is so, then how can we reconcile this apparent inconsistency? Simply come to see that though we do lose joy in our feeling, nevertheless the joy we gain issues from a pure faith and cannot be destroyed. Joy of this caliber runs far deeper than emotion. In becoming spiritual, we abandon the old desire for self-pleasure and hence additionally the former search for bliss. But the peace and joy of the Spirit, which arises from faith, remains forever. After the Spirit To walk after the Spirit, a Christian must deny every scintilla of his life of feeling. He must move by faith and eliminate the crutches of wonderful sensation to which the flesh naturally clings. When he is following the Spirit, he neither fears if he receives no help from feeling, nor if feeling opposes him. But when his faith is weak, and he follows not the Spirit, he then will heed the support of the visible, the sensible, and the touchable. Emotion replaces intuition and guidance whenever spiritual life grows weak. He who abides in feeling will come to see that, having long sought pleasurable sensations, he shall soon seek, as well, the help of the world, because feeling rests nowhere save in the world. An emotional Christian often employs his own way and seeks man's help. To follow the leading of the Spirit requires faith, for it usually is contrary to feeling. Without faith, no one can actually march forward. A soulish person ceases to serve God the moment he becomes depressed. On the other hand, one who lives by faith does not delay in serving the Lord until he becomes joyful. He simply goes forward while beseeching God to increase the strength of his spirit that he may overcome any depressed feeling which may descend. The Life of the Will The life of faith can be called the life of the will, since faith is impervious to how one feels, but chooses through volition to obey God's mind. Though the Christian may not feel like obeying God, even so, he wills to obey Him. We find two opposite kinds of Christians. One depends on emotion, the other relies on the renewed will. A Christian who trusts in feeling can obey God solely while he is deriving stimulus from his feeling, that is, excitable feeling. The one, however, who depends on volition determines that he shall serve God amid whatever circumstance or feeling. His will reflects his real opinion, 
whereas his feeling is only activated by outside stimulus. From God's viewpoint, not much value accrues in doing his will out of a pleasurable sensation. To do so is merely to be persuaded by the joy of God, and not by a wholehearted aspiration to do his will. Except he neither feels a bit of joy, nor is stimulated by some wonderful feeling, and yet decides to do God's will, can the Christian's obedience be counted truly valuable, because it flows from his honest heart and expresses his respect for God and disregard of self. The distinction between the spiritual and the soulless Christian lies precisely there. The soulless primarily considers himself and therefore only obeys God when he feels his desire is satisfied. The spiritual has a will fully cooperating with God and hence accepts his arrangement without wavering, even though he has no outside help or stimulus. Of what have we to boast if we obey God merely while we experience joy in our body? Or how can we brag if we enjoy the cheer of the Lord while suffering? Precious is it in God's sight if we determine to obey His mind and suffer for Him, even when the comfort, love, help, presence, and joy of the Lord are absent. A great number of believers are unconscious of the fact that to walk by the Spirit is to walk by the will which is joined to God. A will which is not so joined is untrustworthy and inconsistent. It requires a will that is entirely yielded to God's to always choose what the Spirit desires. In the early stage of their Christian experience, they heard how other saints enjoyed unutterable bliss during obedience or suffering. They ardently admired such a life, so they too offered themselves exclusively to the Lord with the hope of possessing this higher life. In truth, Following their consecration, they did experience time and again the Lord's intimacy and love, which prompted them to conclude that their hope had been realized. But far too soon did these wonderful experiences become past history. Because they are unaware that the expression of true spiritual life issues not from feeling, but from the will, many suffer endless pains, for these believe they have lost their spiritual life when no happy sensation is felt. Such ones, at a time of low feeling, need to ascertain whether their original heart of consecration has been changed, or whether they still harbor the desire to do God's will. Are they yet disposed to suffer for Him? Is there any change in their readiness to do anything, or go anywhere for God? If these have not been altered, then their spiritual life has not receded. But if these have changed, their life in the Spirit has indeed receded. Just as one's retrogression is not due to any loss of joy, but to the weakening of his will in obedience to God, so his progress is not because he possesses many delightful feelings now which he previously did not, but because of a deeper union of his will with God. It is this which renders him more inclined to follow God's will, more amenable to his desires. The touchstone of genuine spiritual life is how much one's volition is united with God's. Good or bad sensation, happy or sad feeling, does not in the slightest serve as an indicator. If one is willing, however dry he may feel, to be faithful to God even to death, his spiritual course becomes the noblest. Spirituality is measured by our volition because it unfolds our undisguised condition. When our choices and decisions are yielded to God, we may safely say we have yielded to God and no longer act as our own sovereign. Self stands in opposition to spiritual life. With self broken down, that life grows up. Should self remain strong, that life will suffer. We accordingly can judge one's spirituality by looking into his will. Feeling, on the contrary, is distinctly different. For even if we possess the most glorious sensations, we are nonetheless full of self, being self-gratified and self-pleased. Let not those who sincerely strive after spiritual growth be deceived into thinking that feeling is their life principle, because this shall entice them to be mindful always of tingling sensation. Just be certain that the will is utterly offered to God. Joy or no joy is not to be the consideration. God wants us to live by faith. Should He wish us to live by faith and be satisfied solely with His will, bereft of consolation or ecstatic delight for long duration, would we be inclined to so live? 
we should delight in our having obeyed the mind of God, not in being accorded some joy. God's will alone should be sufficient to make us joyful. The Duty of Man While a Christian is governed by feeling, he invariably will neglect his duty towards others. This is because he makes himself the sinner and is consequently unfit to care for the needs of others. For a Christian, to fulfill his duty, it requires faith and will. Responsibility ignores feeling. Our duty towards men is defined, and our responsibility in the mundane affairs of life is certain. These cannot be altered according to one's changing emotion. Duty must be performed according to principle. During the period that a Christian knows the truth merely in his feeling, he certainly cannot fulfill his duty. He is so taken up with the joy from fellowshipping with the Lord that that is all he pursues. His greatest temptation is to want to do nothing but be alone with the Lord and bask in this joy. He does not like the work in which he formerly was engaged because it holds out no other prospect than many trials and troubles. When face to face with the Lord, he senses intense holiness and victory. But when he emerges to perform his daily tasks, he finds himself as defeated and defiled as before. What he wants is to escape his duties. He hopes that by lingering lengthily before the Lord, he can remain holy and victorious the longer. He views these matters of duty as earthy and unworthy of occupying the attention of so pure and triumphant a person as he. Since he cares so much about finding time and place to commune with the Lord and hates so deeply those works which are his duties, he naturally neglects the need and welfare of those around him. Parents and servants who think like this do not, respectively, take good care of their children nor serve their masters faithfully, because they judge these duties as worldly, therefore of negligible worth. They believe they must seek something more spiritual. The reason for this unbalanced approach is the believer's failure to walk by faith. He continues to look for self-support. He has not yet been united fully with God. Hence he needs special time and special place to commune with God. He has not learned to discern the Lord in all matters and to cooperate accordingly with Him. He does not know how to be united with the Lord in the daily details of living. His experience of God is but in His feeling, and so He loves to erect a tent on the mountain and dwell there permanently with the Lord, but hates to descend to the plain to cast the demon away. The loftiest Christian experience is never contradictory to the duties of one's pathway. In reading the letters to the Romans, Colossians, and Ephesians, we can plainly see how perfectly a Christian must perform his duty as a man. His highest life does not necessitate special hour and situation in order to be manifested. It can be thoroughly expressed at any time or place. To the Lord, there is no dichotomy between household work and preaching or praying. The life of Christ can be exhibited through all sorts of activity. As a consequence to living an emotional life, we become dissatisfied with our present position and are loath to perform the duties connected with that position. We revolt because in those duties we do not find the pleasure we seek. But our life is not for pleasure. Why do we therefore look for it again? The path of feeling bids us neglect our duty. The path of faith calls us not to forsake our duty to friends or foes. If we are united with God in every detail of living, we shall know what are our tasks and how we should properly fulfill them. In the Work of God To deny the life of emotion and live by faith completely is one of the basic requirements for serving God. An emotional believer is useless in God's hand. He who walks by feeling knows how to enjoy pleasure but not how to work for God. He has not yet attained the status of a worker, since he lives for himself and not for God. Living for the Lord is the prerequisite to working for him. A Christian must realize the way of faith before he can be a useful instrument to God and actually perform his work. Otherwise, his aim in life is pleasure. He works for the sake of feeling, and for that reason he will stop working. His heart is brimming with self-love. If he is placed by the Lord in a field of labor, filled with physical and emotional suffering, he begins to pity himself and finally gives up. 
But even as the work of the Lord Jesus was that of the cross, exactly so is the work of a Christian to be. What pleasure is there in such work? Except Christians utterly commit their emotion and their heart of self-love to death, God can hardly find any real workers. Today, the Lord needs men to be His followers, who shall trail Him to the end. Too many saints labor for the Lord when the task is prosperous, is suited to their interest, or does not imperil their feeling. But how quickly they retreat should the cross come upon them and require them to die and give them no help except to lay hold of God by faith. We know that if a work is veritably accomplished by God, there cannot but be results. Yet supposing one has been commissioned by the Lord and has labored for eight or ten years without achieving any results, can he continue to labor faithfully simply because God has commanded it? How many saints are there who serve purely because it is God's command? Or how many work just to produce fruits? Since God's work is eternal in nature, he demands men with faith to labor for him. It is difficult for human beings who live in time to perceive and to understand the work of God, for it is replete with eternal character. How then can those who live by feeling ever join in in God's work since nothing in it can please their feeling? Unless the death of the cross cuts penetratingly into the soul of a believer so that he reserves nothing for self, he cannot follow the Lord in work except to a limited extent. Beyond that, he is unable to go. God asks for men who are totally broken and who will follow him even to death to work for him. In Battling the Enemy Those who live by feeling are even more worthless in spiritual warfare, because to battle the enemy in prayer is truly a self-denying work. What incalculable suffering is involved? Nothing for satisfying one's self can be found here. It is pouring out one's all for the body of Christ and the kingdom of God. How unbearable must be this resisting and wrestling in the spirit. What pleasure is there for the spirit to be laden with indescribable burden for the sake of God? Is it interesting to attack the evil spirit with every ounce of strength one can summon? This is a prayer warfare. But for whom is the believer praying? Not for himself, surely, but for the work of God. Such prayer is for warfare, which is thoroughly lacking in interest one usually encounters during ordinary prayer. Is there anything in this that can make him feel comfortable? when he must travail in his soul and pray to destroy and to build? No element in spiritual warfare can gladden the flesh, unless, of course, one is contending merely in his imagination. An emotional Christian is easily defeated in conflict with Satan. While he is praying to assault the enemy, the latter by his evil spirit will attack his emotion. He will set the Christian to feeling that such contesting is painful and such prayer life is lifeless. So as he becomes sorrowful, insipid, dark, and dry, he immediately stops fighting. An emotional Christian is powerless to war against Satan, for as soon as his feeling comes under attack by Satan, he quits the field of battle. If one's emotion has not experienced death, he may provide opportunity to Satan to strike at any hour. Each time he rises to oppose the enemy, he is defeated by a satanic touch upon his feeling. Can anyone expect victory over Satan? unless he has first overcome his life of sensation? Spiritual warfare accordingly demands an attitude of total death to feeling and an absolute trust in God. Only a person with this attitude can bear up alone and not seek companions or man's approval in fighting the enemy. Only this caliber of Christian can proceed under all sorts of anguished feelings. He cares not at all for his life nor about death, but only cares for the leading of God. He indulges no personal interest, desire, or longing. He has offered himself to death already, and then lives exclusively for God. He neither blames nor misunderstands him because he considers all his ways to be loving. This is the class of person who is able to fill the breach. Though he may appear to be deserted by God and forgotten by men, yet he mans his battle station. He is a prayer warrior. He overcomes Satan. Rest. After a believer has thus been dealt with, he can commence the walk of faith, which is true spiritual life. And the one who arrives at this position enters upon a life of rest. The fire of the cross has consumed his every greedy pursuit. 
he at last has learned his lesson. He recognizes that God's will alone is precious. All else, though naturally desirable, is incompatible with the highest life of God. Now he rejoices in relinquishing everything. Whatever the Lord deems necessary to withdraw, he gladly allows his hand to do it. The sighing, mourning, and grieving, which arose out of his former anticipation, seeking, and struggling, have today entirely disappeared. He realizes that the loftiest life is one lived for God, and one obedient to His will. Though he has lost everything, yet is he satisfied with the fulfillment of God's purpose. Though he is left with nothing to enjoy, yet is he humble under the ordering of God. So long as the Lord is pleased, he cares not the least what happens to him. He now has perfect rest. Nothing external can any longer stimulate him. Presently, the child of God abides by a will which is united with the Lord. His volition, today filled with spiritual strength, is competent to control his emotion. His walk is steady, firm, restful. His former situation of ups and downs has vanished. Even so, we must not now rush to the conclusion that henceforth he shall never again be ruled by emotion. For before we enter heaven itself, such sinless perfection is not possible. Nonetheless, in comparing his present state with his former condition, this one can indeed be described as experiencing rest, being established, and continuing firm. He suffers no further from that incessant confusion he encountered heretofore, though occasionally he may still be disturbed by the operation of his emotion. That is why watchful prayer continues to be indispensable. Let us therefore hasten to add, do not misunderstand what has been said to mean that from here on there shall be no possibility of feeling either joy or sorrow. As long as our organ for emotion is not annihilated, it never will be, our feeling shall continue to exist. We still can sense pain, blackness, aridity, and sorrow. Yet those sufferings can penetrate our outer man only, leaving our inner man untouched. Due to the clear division between spirit and soul, outwardly our soul may be disturbed, and consequently suffer, but inwardly our spirit remains calm and composed as though nothing had happened. Upon arriving at this restful position, the believer shall find that all he heretofore had lost for the Lord's sake has today been restored. He has gained God, and therefore everything belonging to God belongs to him as well. What the Lord had withdrawn before, he now can properly enjoy in him. The reason why God at the beginning had led him through many sorrows was because his soul life lay behind everything, seeking and asking too much for himself, desiring even things which were outside God's will. Such independent action had to be circumscribed by God. Now that he has lost himself, that is, his natural life, the Christian is in a position to enjoy the bliss of God within its legitimate boundary. Not till today was he qualified to be rightly related to his joy. Hereafter, He can thankfully accept whatever is given him, because the eagerness to secure something for self has already been put to naught. He does not position inordinately for that which was not bestowed upon him. Such a child of God has advanced onto a pure ground. Where there is mixture, there is impurity. The Bible views impurity as something defiled. Before one reaches this ground of no mixture, he cannot express a pure walk. He lives for God yet also lives for self. He loves the Lord, but loves himself as well. His intention is unto God, yet simultaneously he aims at self-glory, self-pleasure, self-comfort. Such a life is a defiled one. He walks by faith, but also walks by feeling. He follows the spirit, but also follows the soul. While he does not in fact reserve the larger portion for himself, nonetheless, This smaller portion held back is sufficient to render his life impure. Only what is pure is clean. Anything mixed with foreign matter becomes defiled. When a believer has experienced the practical treatment of the cross, he finally arrives at a pure life. All is for God and in God, and God is in all as well. Nothing is unto self. Even the tiniest desire for pleasing oneself is crucified. Self-love has been consigned to death. The present aim of existence becomes single. 
to do the will of God. So long as He is pleased, nothing else really counts. To obey Him becomes the sole objective of life. It does not matter how He feels. What matters is obeying God. This is a pure walk. Although God affords Him peace, comfort, and bliss, He does not enjoy them for the sake of gratifying His desire. He from now on views everything with God's eye. His soulish life has been terminated and the Lord has granted him a pure, restful, true, and believing spiritual life. While it is God who does destroy him, it equally is God who builds him up. That which is soulish has been destroyed, but that which is spiritual has been established.